from Hollywood. It's time now for Edmund O'Brien as... Johnny Dollar. We're ready on your call to Boston. Go ahead, please. Hello? Yes? Mr. Semplin, this is Johnny Dollar. Johnny Dollar? I don't believe I remember you, Mr. Dollar. Well, we've never met. Your company hired me here in Hartford to investigate the Joan Sebastian death. Oh? It's odd that they didn't advise me. Well, they probably will. I called you to find out the name of the officer in charge of the case, if I could. It's a uh, Lieutenant De Rosa. De Rosa. Do you happen to know what their theory is, if any? Theory? I don't think they've arrived at a definite theory. Still a toss-up between murder and suicide, huh? Okay, Mr. Semplin. I'll be in touch. Edmund O'Brien in a transcribed adventure of the man with the action-packed expense account. America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to Home Office, Corinthian Life Insurance Company, Hartford, Connecticut. The following is an accounting of expenditures during my investigation of the Joan Sebastian matter. Expense account item one, 175 phone call to Boston, advising your manager there of my assignment. Item two, $28 car rental and mileage from my Hartford apartment to police headquarters, Boston. What's the matter, Dollar? Don't you trust us? Well, it's not up to me to mistrust you, Lieutenant. These insurance people get uneasy when there's a choice between suicide and murder. Unless the murder motive is the policy. And you don't think there's a chance of that? I wouldn't say definitely not, but the Sebastian girl made her mother her beneficiary. And her mother's an invalid in a rest home. Did, uh, did you know the mother has taken up with an old flame? No, I didn't. Oh, yeah. It goes to see her a couple, three times a week. Crazier things have happened. I'll, uh, get the fire for you. Sit down. Now, uh, this is all we've got so far, pending the coroner's inquest and the autopsy report. Here's a photo of where she was found. Ah, shallow water. That's the bridge? Uh Uh-huh. Now, she was lying right about there. But I don't think you have to worry about suicide, Dollar. As far as I'm concerned, it wasn't. Hmm. I'll buy that, too. I wouldn't say this bridge is a suicide type. It's too low. Yeah, yeah. And there's another thing. I've been on the force for more years than I like to count, and I've run into my share of suicides. But I've never known a woman to do it that way without taking off her coat. Oh? Yeah, usually shoes, too. I've learned that's part of a generally accepted pattern. The Sebastian girl didn't fit the pattern, huh? Yeah, here's uh, here's the way she looked. Coat on, belt still tied. Shoes. Her purse is still missing. We're searching the stream for it. How old was she? Twenty-one. She's a beautiful girl. Yeah, I noticed that. I try not to, but with her, I couldn't help it. How much questioning have you done, Lieutenant? Oh, not as much as we'll do after the inquest. When will that be? Day after tomorrow. Do you want anything more here? No, thanks. I'll, uh, I'll give you the background we have on her. It's in my office. I won't bother any more, Lieutenant DeRosa. Besides, I like to dig up backgrounds myself. I know them better if I do. Thanks a lot for your cooperation. I drove out to the stream where they'd found the girl's body, and there chalked up another point against her death being a suicide. The bridge from which she had dropped was a good four miles from town. On the assumption that she'd been brought there in a car, the placement of a body in regard to the two lanes on the bridge made it look as if the car was going toward Boston, not away from it. Five minutes later, I was heading the same way. Mary O'Neill? Yes? The manager suggested I come up. He told me you shared this apartment with Joan Sebastian. That's right. Who are you? My name's Dollar. I'm from her insurance company. I'd like to talk to you about her if I could. Oh, I suppose so, but there's nothing I can do now. This is the biggest shock I've ever had. I always said there'd be trouble. But I I I never thought she'd do anything like this. Maybe she didn't. What's that supposed to mean? Well, there are signs that say maybe she didn't commit suicide. There are? Do you think she had any reason to? Well, that's what I said. I never thought she would. Sit down. Any place. Thanks. 
Poor little Joe. What does it mean? I'm not sure. Did you say you expected trouble? Oh, yeah, I kept telling her. It was the way she went, like she couldn't live fast enough, like, like there wasn't time to get everything done. She'd been like that ever since she got rid... I mean, her mother went into that hospital. Johnny was all tied down taking care of her before. What could have caused the trouble? Well, I, I'm not saying she was wrong or anything, but... Well, there were too many men. I imagine that was easy for her. Sure was. Too easy. Do you mind telling me who they were? Well, I, I don't know. Only only about one. Harold Corey. He's gone with us the longest. Harold Corey? Yes, he drives for the North American van lines. And sometimes he goes way out to the West Coast. And, well, while he was gone, Joni didn't stay home and catch up on a reading, if you know what I mean. I think I do. She went out with a different guy almost every night. I didn't pry, but she she never tell me who they were. You think somebody killed her, don't you? Would you help me try to find out? What, what could I do? You didn't want to pry, but I get paid to. I'd like to look at her things. Well, I suppose it's my duty, sort of, isn't it? In a way, yeah. But I can't force you to. Oh, I, I know it's a thing to do. Some of her drawers are locked, but I'll, I'll show you what I can. I started on the locked dresser drawers. They gave up and opened after a brief struggle, but contained on the whole things that might normally be locked up because of their value. Imported perfumes, expensive lingerie, and some jewelry. The only thing that looked as if it might have been hidden for the sake of secrecy was under the jewel box. It was a gold key, a functional house-type key, but with meaning added because the head of the key was heart-shaped. It hung from a fine gold chain. I never saw that before. Never saw the perfume before either, but I smelled it. That's a few hundred dollars worth of scent. And the rest of it was, uh, was Joan used to such expensive things? Well, not that I know about. Harold Corey sure couldn't shell out that kind of money. And heart-shaped key. That's cozy. I'd like to keep it if I could. Oh, I, I don't know about that. After all, it isn't mine. I might get into trouble. You won't, I promise you. I'm working with the police on this thing. I want to find out where it was made if I can and who ordered it. Oh, I get it. Sure, I, I wouldn't stop you from doing that, even if I could. North American Van Lines. I wonder if I can get some information about a driver of yours, Harold Corey. I phoned his home and couldn't get him. Is he out of town? Uh, just a second. Yeah, Harold Corey's on a run to Philadelphia. Oh, when's he due back? He's uh, due in the night, about, uh, or about 3 a.m. tomorrow morning. Thanks very much. <laughs> Expense account item three, seven dollars, drinks and dinner after I checked into the Bristol Hotel. Item four, a nickel, phone call to Joan Sebastian's employer. Edward Hollis was at home and would see me. living room, Mr. Dollar. We may as well be comfortable. It's nice of you to see me, Mr. Hollis. I thought it'd be better to do it this way rather than bother you at work. Of course, and I appreciate it. The atmosphere at the office has been gloomy enough. Oh, uh, this is Mrs. Hollis, Mr. Dollar. Oh, how do you do? Quite well, thank you. I didn't know the poor girl, but it's a dreadful thing. Yes, I'm afraid it is. They don't understand. A young girl like that with everything to live for. Well, it, it may be even worse than that. Worse? How could it be worse? It looks more and more like her death was not a suicide. Oh. Mr. Dollar. I didn't mention it on the phone. The, the police think it was murder, though, and so do I. I thought it'd be better to save the blow until I got out here. You know, murder's pretty messy. Well, this is a shock. I, I suppose I could be dragged into a courtroom along with everybody else who knew her. Edward. Uh, Beatrice, uh, you run along upstairs. There's no reason for your going through this. All right, Edward. I think I'd rather... Good night, Mr. Dollar. Good night. I'm sorry, but it couldn't be helped. Of course it couldn't. I understand. I'll make this as fast as possible, Mr. Hollis. I don't know how much you knew about Joan Sebastian's private life. I knew nothing. 
I have a number of girls in the office, and it's been my philosophy to remember that not too long ago, I was as young as they are. As long as they do their work well, I ask no questions. As a matter of fact, I have no right to. Sure. From what I've gathered, she was mixed up emotionally. She hadn't had much freedom because of an invalid mother she took care of. Well, I did know that. When her mother went to a hospital, Joan began to make up for lost time. She led her friends to believe that she ran around with a lot of men. But I don't believe that. Oh? I think it was one man. Would you give me the names of the girls she worked with? I'd like to talk to them and find out if something may have come out over lunch or cocktail. Yes, I... I'd rather my staff wasn't upset too much, but uh, I'll tell you. Uh, you'll want to question them separately? That's right. And I could give you the names now, but uh, if you'll phone me at the office in the morning, I'll give you their addresses and phone numbers. That would help. Uh, good. You can call any time after 9.30. <laughs> I called the next morning and got a list of six feminine names which I pocketed for later reference. And at 10.30, I was at the home of Harold Corey, a ground floor apartment on Hemingway Street. Yeah, who is it? My name is Dollar. Come later, will you? I don't want to talk to anybody right now. I'm an insurance investigator. I want to talk to you about Joan Sebastian. Who have you talked to? Why did she do it? She didn't. What do you mean? It's a mistake? In a way, yeah. It's murder. Murder? You're crazy. Am I? No, well, maybe you are. She'd never kill herself, would she? She had no reason to. When did you see her last? The night before I left for Philadelphia. When was that? Two nights ago, Tuesday. I left at five Wednesday morning. She was found Wednesday morning. What are you driving at, mister? When did you learn that she was seeing somebody else when you were out of town? Didn't know she was. Look, Corey, I'm not tossing suspicions around to see how they bounce off you. You're in a bad way, do you know that? You're telling me you think I killed her? Me? I loved her. I wanted to marry her. That's a motive, not an alibi. Get out of here, will you? Leave me alone. You aren't helping yourself with this act. You're making it worse. Get out of here before I do have a murder to answer for. Get out. Get out! <laughs> Lieutenant DeRosa. This is Dollar, Lieutenant. Hey, I've been kicking myself for not getting your hotel yesterday. Well, I didn't have one then, but I got a few things to pass along to you now. Well, if it's the Sebastian thing, save him. What do you mean? It's suicide after all. How come? Autopsy report. There was concussion from that drop from the bridge, but that wasn't the cause of death. Now, wait a minute. Cause of death was from carbon monoxide. It looks like she pulled the suicide where it would embarrass somebody, and they tossed her in the creek to get her out of the way. Hello? You still there, Dollar? Yeah, I'm still here. This is where I came in. We'll return you to the second act of yours truly, Johnny Dollar, in just a moment. But first, one of radio's greatest stars has returned to CBS The Star's Address. He's Frank Sinatra. Frank will be here every Sunday afternoon for a full hour of songs, comedy, and commentary on popular music. The Frank Sinatra Show is a part of CBS's new lineup of entertainment on Sunday afternoons. Join CBS every Sunday afternoon, won't you? Now, with our star, Edmund O'Brien, we return you to the second act of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. Yes, Sergeant said you were waiting for me. Oh, yeah, yeah. I told him you'd be showing up. Sit down, Dollar. You didn't seem to like the latest development. Well, I've been working from other directions. Give it to me again, will you? Well, here's the autopsy report. Death by asphyxia caused by carbon monoxide, agent unknown. Probably automobile engine exhaust. That's the most popular these days. Do you believe this, Lieutenant? I believe what's on the report. And how did you say she got into the river? I said maybe she committed suicide somewhere so that somebody would get involved. Maybe in the driveway of somebody who didn't want to get involved. To get rid of her, she was probably moved to the stream. What's the matter? Don't you like that? What else does the report say? Oh, uh, symptoms of severe concussion. 
I thought you'd be happy with this suicide evidence. The insurance company hired me to dig up facts. If it was suicide, all right. But if it wasn't, they want to know that, too. And I don't think it was. Why not? Well, from what I've learned, she wasn't the type. She liked to be alive, and she played it hard enough to leave some motives lying around. Jealousy, for one. That boyfriend of hers? Ah, you know about him, then. Yeah, Corey, isn't it? A truck driver? That's right. And then there's this. Look. What's this unlock? I wish I could tell you. It was given to her by somebody. I'd like to know who. Would you put a couple of men on it, find out where it was made? I could do it, but I think the police can get it done faster. All right, Dollar, I'll stick my neck out that far. I'm under orders, you know that. I have to be assigned before I can investigate. Yeah, sure, sure. But I'll take your story upstairs and see what the chief says. Let me know what else you find. I will. Uh, say, do you have the address of the old flame you mentioned? The mother's friend? <laughs> Still like to settle for fraud, wouldn't you? <laughs> the desk sergeant will give you his address. His name's Paul Anderson. <laughs> Mr. Anderson? I am. I'm from Joan Sebastian's insurance company. One of you'd spare me a few moments. Why, yes, I suppose so. Come in. I didn't know she had a policy. She did. $25,000 to go to her mother. I see. Her death has been classed as a suicide, which voids the policy. The two-year self-destruction clause is still in effect. And that's a pity. Why'd you say that? Well, it's the least she could do for poor Mildred. That's her mother? Yes, an extremely young mother. It was almost ruined her life for that girl. I didn't know that. Daughter was born when Mildred was only 17. She was left to care for the child herself. I helped as much as I could. How well did you know the girl after she grew up? Why, she's a friend of her mother's. Why do you ask? Which one did you know first? I don't see what this has to do with the matter. You don't have to answer. I don't want you to misunderstand. There's nothing to be hidden. I suppose it is unusual. I did meet Joan first... But when she took me to her house and I met her mother, I realized that Joan was, well, no more than a cheap little opportunist. The complete opposite from her mother. As I say, I suppose it is unusual. And that doesn't make any difference. Point is that you dropped the girl in favor of her mother. Is that it? It wasn't the gross situation you evidently wish it had been. I realized Mildred's condition and the lack of care. I knew she needed someone, and I, I did what I could for her. Did you send her to the rest home? I did. Now, look here. This has gone far enough. You asked me these questions for one reason, so that you can make your own conclusions, haven't you? I didn't know it showed. It does. You think I sent Mildred to the home to get her out of the way, don't you? That is not the case. You can think what you like. Go ask Mildred if you care to. I won't bother her. Do you know anything about a gold key that Joan had? A gold key? No, I don't know anything about a gold key. I've known very little about Joan all these past months. I could have told you that she was headed toward a bad end a long time ago. Now she's reached it. There's no one to blame but herself. It was 4 p.m. then, and at 5, I was standing in front of the North American Van Building on Columbus Avenue as Harold Corey backed a big rig into a parking area and headed for a quick-order restaurant. Hello, Corey. What this time? Dispatcher tells me you're going out in another run. Pretty short layover, isn't it? That's right. I asked for it. I figured driving, I'd get my mind off this thing. What do you want? Do you know how she died? I read about it. Carbon monoxide. Do you still think it couldn't have been suicide? She's dead. That's as far as I can think. You knew about Paul Anderson, didn't you? What about Paul? That he might have been more interested in Joan than he was in her mother? I suppose you're just doing a job, aren't you? What you say is true. I didn't know about it. If I had known about it, I would have gone after him, not Joan. I can't take any more, mister. Look, I don't enjoy it either, Corey. Like you say, I'm just doing a job. <laughs> After questioning the six girls who had worked with Joan Sebastian, I was still nowhere. None of them knew anything about a private life. But the next morning, the police located a goldsmith who said he remembered making the key.
The police told me you might come in, Mr. Dutter. No trouble at all. <laughs> We're happy to oblige. Good. You've seen the key? Yes, the officer showed it to me. Oh, friendly young man. I have it with me. You're sure you made it? Oh, yes, positive. See here? I'll admit to a quaint conceit. You see here? Part of the scroll? See the letter? Where? Oh, yeah. Yeah, C.S. My initials, Cedric Foss. Oh. And I haven't the faintest the recollection who I made it for. I told that young officer that, too. I don't even remember when. Oh, there's so much work, you know. Well, maybe I can help you. It would have been between seven and eight months ago. You keep any kind of record? Oh, of course I do. I'm bound to. A matter of law. Seven or eight months should have... Uh, let me see. That would be uh, November, October, September. Seven would be March. Uh, eight would be February. Oh, yes, yes, of course. Here we are, here we are. Oh, frankly, I'm intrigued. How many of my items may have been involved with tragedy? Who knows? Perhaps I'm a curse. <laughs> I was hoping you'd be a cure for this one. Well, I hope so. You wouldn't know what week or day... Oh, I'm afraid not. Uh, 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 uh. Oh, my. Uh, oh, my. Uh. February wasn't a very good month, was it? Uh, Post-holiday slump. Reset, change rings high. Set opals. Uh, dreadful stuff. Uh, oh, oh. Hmm? What? No, 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 no. That's much too small. Key for a jewel box. Well, let me see. Let me see. Uh, ah, March. Yes, yeah, engraved spoon. Reset, reset, repair, place. Ah, yeah. oh. oh. here it is. Door key in gold. March seventeenth. What name? <laughs> Do not deliver. Will call J. E. Carter. J. E. Carter. Does that help? No, no, not a bit. Do you remember anything about him? No, paid in cash. Uh, oh, wait, now, that was the day Mrs. Brand brought the baby shoe in for placing. She's the councilman's wife. I remember that. It was snowing. That was the day it was ordered, Yes, huh? now, wait a minute, wait a minute. It was modeled from a plain old cast house key. Uh-huh. I cannot picture him. But I'd done some apartment keys, and he said this was for a cottage. Outside of town? It was a surprise for his wife, someplace on the bay. I remember that because of the hideous weather, and I could just feel that wind coming through one of those summer cottages. Now, do you think you'd recognize him if you saw him again? Well, I can't say until I do. Uh, I could try. Uh, well, we may have to call on you then. Thanks. Thanks a lot. I think you've helped. <laughs> How'd you make out with that fussy little man, Dollar? We found the day the key was ordered, and he remembered a few things because a councilman's wife came in the same day. Why? Well, the customer, Carter was the name he used, mentioned a cottage on the bay. Now, that's east, and the girl's body was found northwest of here. I think she was dumped from a car coming toward Boston from out there. So I think the cottage is in that direction. <laughs> Deduction, yet. Look, if I were going to dump a body, I wouldn't carry it across two traffic lanes, would you? I'm being paid to think about another case. I couldn't sell the murder pitch upstairs. But I tried, and I'll buck for a promotion if you're right and upstairs is wrong. I don't suppose you could earn that promotion by assigning some men to cover that section. Huh? Oh, not a chance. That's county. Division of responsibility. Yeah. Uh-huh. And I, for one, wouldn't be surprised to know how many people have died because of that division of responsibility. <laughs> Expense account item four, $35 mileage covering a two-and-a-half-day search of real estate offices northwest of Boston. Object, a cottage rented a few days before March 17th by a man possibly using the name J.E. Carter. It was morning tonight legwork, but on the afternoon of the third day, it paid off. I found an agent who had rented a cottage to a J.E. Carter. She took me out, but before we went into the place, I noticed a lean-to garage marked up by plenty of tire tracks. Inside, I found a stained rug, among other things. Well, Mr. Dollar, I've always said I personally vouch for the people I do business with. Uh, you never know, do you? I should say you don't. Do you want to go now? I think I've seen enough. Let me lock it. I want to see if this key fits. It does fit. Yeah, it sure does. Oh, Mr. Dunn. Hello, Mr. Hollis. May I come in? Why, yes, yes, of course. Come in. 
Where I didn't expect you to come back. Didn't you, Mr. Hollis? You thought you'd get away with this, huh? What did you say? Well, now, there's no reason to be clever with each other, Mr. Hollis. I know you killed her. You rented a cottage out beyond Mystic River. You used the name J.E. Carter when you bought the gold key. I did that? I'm afraid you did. Come into the other room. Yes, you're right, I did. I became infatuated with her. If you'd known her, you'd understand. I I realized last week that it had to stop, and I told her. She uh, had been going with that young Corey boy. I told her that even if I were single and eligible to marry, I would advise her to hang on to him, someone her own age. That was last Tuesday night? Yes. She left the cottage, and I heard her drive off. Or at least I thought I did. When I went out, I... I learned what she had really done. She committed suicide in the car. You can hardly blame me for wanting to keep the secret. Oh, you've been reading the papers, Mr. Hollis. Suicide and all that. I've been inside your cottage. You didn't do a very good job of cleaning up the bloodstains. You're right, Mr. Dollar. There seems to be no longer any reason to attempt cleverness. I'll make my statement to the police. I'll drive you down. Thank you. How did you find out, Dollar? There was a Wall Street Journal there, addressed to you. Oh, I see. Edward? Now, Beatrice, go upstairs. No, Edward, I won't. I insist, Beatrice. What good would it do? Do what I've done because I lost you? Why should you ask me to go upstairs while I lose you again? I forbid you to say another word. Forbid, Edward. You have no right. I found them, the dollar. It took a long time, but I found them. She had taken him from me because she was beautiful. And I no longer am. I was waiting in the cottage. And when they came in, I struck her. Is this true, Mrs. Hollis? I killed her. And since there was nothing left, we carried her to the cop. <laughs> Beatrice. Beatrice, what have I done? What have I done? <laughs> Expense account item five, $110, final bill for car rental. Item six, $85, miscellaneous. Expense account total, $356.75. Remarks? I don't know what sticklers the Massachusetts law courts are, but Joan Sebastian was not killed by the wronged wife. She was unconscious but alive when Hollis put her in his car trunk. She died there by carbon monoxide. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, stars Edmund O'Brien in the title role and is written by Gil Dowd with music by Wilbur Hatch. Edmund O'Brien may soon be seen in the Paramount Pictures production, Warpath. Featured in tonight's cast were Virginia Gregg, Howard McNear, Virginia Eiler, Wally Mayer, John Stevenson, Bill Johnstone, and Raymond Burr. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar is transcribed in Hollywood by Jaime Del Valle. This is Dan Coverly inviting you to join us next week at this time when we will again bring you Edmund O'Brien as... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Stay tuned for Von Monroe's Caravan, which follows immediately over most of these same CBS stations. This is CBS, where Hopalong Cassidy rides every Saturday night. The Columbia Broadcasting System. <laughs>